Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. So I'm super excited for today's video because we're going to be discussing a topic that I've long thought was super interesting, which is the neuroscience of dreams. Why we dream, what our brains are doing when we dream, and why don't we know more about dreams? And luckily for me, one of my very best friends is a neuroscientist, and she has agreed to dig into these topics with me today. Her name is Dr. Tapring Paquato, and she has a PhD in neuroscience from Brandeis and an undergraduate degree in computer science from Georgetown. And she has done research on issues such as traumatic brain injuries, stroke, and hearing impairments. And much of her res- mm, Leaf blower. Leaf blower. I hate you. Go away. <laughs> and much of her research early on in her career focused on our memory ability as we age and start to have trouble hearing. We've been sharing some papers back and forth on this topic. So without further ado, let's get into it. Okay. Well, hi, Tapring. Welcome. Thank you for doing this with me. <laughs> hello. Good morning. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Um, so before we even kind of get into the whole neuroscience of dreams, you have an awesome first name. And I wanted you to maybe share with our audience where the name Tapring comes from in case they haven't already figured it out. Yes. So um, my parents, you will be able to date them and make <laughs> me. So my name comes from Spock's wife, Spock's betrothed on Star Trek. And so I like to say I was born to lead with logic and reason. So, <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> so to bring going into neuroscience, shocking to no one. Um, that's right. so funny. But isn't it in the show? It's like T apostrophe. Pring, it is that up? capital T apostrophe, capital P pring. So T pring. Oh, okay. And your parents were like, that's just too weird. Uh, yeah. Like, I'm throw in a vowel I was like, that doesn't look American. <laughs> yeah. I have an American little California baby girl. Let's put in an E to pring, like spring to pring yeah. or tepid to pring. Yeah. yeah. I feel like the to pring, like spring has been very helpful. I feel like it was very helpful for my dad. <laughs> yes. What's name again? <laughs> How do you say it? Yeah. Say this. Yeah. Um, well, to jump into it. So in general, let's sort of start broad strokes. What happens to our brains when we sleep? So there are a lot of hypotheses about how our brain is active or inactive or clearing toxins or not clearing toxins. Okay. Um, but overall, I'm going to say, let's just start with the basics. And there are four stages to sleep. Okay. Uh, we call them stage one, two, three, and not four, but REM. Okay. Huh. So the first stage, um, you know, that's right when you're getting to bed, you're sort of, you know, putting your covers on, you're tired, you're just settling in. That's only about five to 10 minutes. Okay. And that's where, you know, if you're having sleep disturbances, they say, how long does it take you to fall asleep? Well, that's that period of like early initial sleep where like, if you're too hot, you're too cold, you hear something, you'll wake back up. Mm -hmm. um, then you go into stage two, it's a little bit deeper, stage three. Um, that's when you're starting to fall into a deeper sleep and it's harder to wake you up. Mm -hmm. And then you get into REM sleep mm -hmm. and that stands for rapid eye movement mm -hmm. and because really behind our eyelids, our eyes are flickering and really actually moving. Right. And we can measure that. Because REM is when we're dreaming, right? Like those first phases one through three, I, I know it's probably not the right way to say it, but it's like, I sort of think of it like the brain powering down, like, boo, boo, boo. but it's really like kind of getting into the place where it's ready for REM, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. starting to, you know, relax our muscles so we don't actually move. Mm -hmm. um, it might be clearing some toxins from its activity. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and it's getting us for the the dream stage, and and the REM is where fundamentally we scientists have evaluated that REM sleep happens, and it's about ninety minute periods. Got it. The REM sleep is in ninety REM chunks. sleep. Yeah, okay. but also we go in and out of sleep cycles. So we don't stay in one and then two and then three and then REM and then wake up in the morning. Oh, okay. So once you drop into long. REM, you're not in it all night long. No, only okay. about 90 minutes. So you might have multiple dreams in a night, whether you remember it or not. And you and scientists can put, you know, a thing on your head and actually record your brain sleeping. Going you know, through those cycles. Night, going Got through it. So yeah. the multiple dreams is because you're starting and stopping REM through the night. Yep. 
Got it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. So I, so it's it, like also in stages one through three, your eyeballs aren't doing anything under the lids, right? Are they just like, Mer, and then as soon as. Yeah. They're, they're like, restful, you know, they're kind oh. of paused for a second. And yeah. 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 Before it goes. So then when you actually do start dreaming, when your eyeballs are doing this, what part of your brain is active then? Or is it all of it active? Or is there like a dream part of your brain? Yeah. So I would definitely say, um, you know, I've said this throughout all of my studies of neuroscience that our brain is used all of the time and all of it. So there may be areas that we say are like inactive, Uh um, you know, because they are less active, but basically even the spots in between neurons, um, uh, are doing something. So in REM sleep stage, a a main component of our brain is called the thalamus. And I like to describe it as a relay station. It's a relay station for our senses. Okay. As you can imagine, we have the senses and in our dreams, we have the sense of touch. Mm -hmm. We have the sense of taste. We have the visual, Mm -hmm. right? And and auditory. Mm -hmm. Now I I skipped the sense of smell because the thalamus is actually a very um, uh, important role for our senses, except for smell. Okay. So old, so ancient in our evolutionary biology that it bypasses the thalamus. And so, so- you know, I haven't learned enough to know whether, um, we have smells in our dreams. It would be really interesting. Yeah. That is interesting. Do Mm -hmm. you ever remember, you know, running through a field and smelling the moisture and the roses and the poppies in the air with smell? But so dreams are also in that thalamus region, but maybe that's why the smell, like people don't really talk about the things they smelled in their dreams last night, or maybe they do. I don't know. I feel like I've never heard that. Right. So now I'm going to go back and think, you know, next time I have a dream, I'm going to be like, did I smell anything? Was I baking bread? Was I making spaghetti? And did I smell it? Oh, I wonder, I'm, I'm going to have to go back and check that out actually. Okay. So it's the thalamus is the portion that is very active. For our senses. Got it. When we dream. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Another area that, that may be really active is obviously our visual cortex, right? So our dreams are very visual, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So people who experience um, early onset blindness when they're children um, or who are born blind, their visual cortex is not developed in the same way. And so we can actually see the activity in the visual cortex is different for right. people who have sight and are not sighted. Got it. Okay. I'm going to come back to this visual cortex thing. Yeah, let's come back. One, of, one of the theories. Well, let's just get into the theory. So, you know, you and I were sort of sharing some some papers uh, before we started this interview about what what some of the theories are as to why we dream, because in kind of do, reading more about sort of the neuroscience of dreams, I was really struck by just the the not knowing the like for something that we do that everyone, I mean, I'm assuming everyone does every day, you know, for good chunks of time, just how much we don't know. So I'm going to play this fun game with you where I'm going to read you some of the theories um, that I've had and you thumbs up, thumbs down, what you think is interesting about them, what you don't just tell me what you think as we go. So can I interrupt before that? Yes, so yes, you, yes. Sorry. Go for it. That's something you said, oh, I think everyone sleeps. I have, there was like a PBS show uh-huh. where there was a individual who doesn't sleep, like doesn't need sleep. Usually when we're sleep deprived, we've done studies after studies, we get really cranky Yeah, and babies that don't take naps and sleep. We, we sleep deprivation is a bad thing, right? Right. Insomnia is bad, bad for immune system, but there is a person that doesn't sleep and doesn't seem to need sleep. And so at nighttime, when the rest of the world is sleeping and, and before even the internet, they used to take a pin, like a, you know, push pin uh-huh. head and they p- learned how to paint with a single hair. And that's what they would do at night is they, they would do these amazing p- paintings, like with dots and like on the head of a pin, what? because the person was like, I need to fill up my eight hours when everyone else is asleep. That's so well, cause my, 
the first thing I was going to say, I'm like, how is this person not going crazy? But now that you are describing what they're doing, maybe they are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Yeah. But that's so, interesting. Cause I like, I feel like in, you know, just sort of like layman's terms of why you can't not sleep. Like you, like it is fulfilling a function that seems in- essential for life, right? It, like you absolutely, but something obviously is going on within their brain, right? Like a rewiring, cross-wiring something. Your brain is absolutely Your absolutely. thalamus is all screwed up. Yes, exactly. <laughs> oh, how so, so you've read about some theories of why we might sleep and yes. why sleep is important. So let's try right. about- to everybody, except for this person that you just mentioned. Except except for that person. PBS that- guy <laughs> is like, your theories are ridiculous. I'm just going to paint over. <laughs> um, well, one of the theories was about memory co- consolidation. And so uh, the theory goes that it, that sleep in general plays a role in memory consolidation. Those who lack proper sleep appear to have worse memory recall and lower ability to focus. Dreaming may contribute to building memory storage in a different way. REM sleep and dreaming could be a place where your brain gets rid of memories it doesn't need or could be harmful in order to make space for useful information. So what are your theory? What is your idea about that or your reaction rather to that theory? Yeah, that's the number one theory that we learn about in school and that we've heard probably mostly about even um, in layman's terms. So like it's the most popular, it's the most commonly common theory. Okay. So, so it is really true, right? We do, we have so much activity. We have so much memory, uh, an area in our brain that is sort of responsible for an important storage area is at our hippocampus. Okay. Um, and we need a, like, think of it as a filing cap cabinet called the hippocamp, um, uh, hippocampus. Mm -hmm. And so sleep is an opportunity for our hippocampus to start filing those in an appropriate way. Mm -hmm. So if it has to do something with family, they file it in the family folder. If it has Mm -hmm. something to work, it's the work folder. If it's something about, you know, our physical abilities, like Mm -hmm. how to walk in the physical ability folder. Mm -hmm. And so it's really a time to start um, helping our brain organize itself. Right. And so Mm -hmm. it's not only memory consolidation, but it's also clearing out. It could be a clearing out of things that we don't need. Right. Right. So Um, it's almost like that's where the brain really mimics like a computer or like your phone, right? You know how your phone every once in a while is like, time to delete these apps you just are not using. And you're like, okay. Kind of like that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so if you think about it like a computer and it's like just taking that time to pause. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's eight hours. We may need eight hours. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's why across our lifespan, it, we sleep for different periods of time. Mm -hmm. And, and more importantly, um, we, we have that REM sleep stage Mm -hmm. for, for much longer of our sleep cycle. So when we're babies, it yeah. could be 50% of our time asleep, which is like 16 hours, right, right. eight hours of it is in that REM stage. Hmm. When we're older adults, you know, our brain is sort of learned how to consolidate, learned how to, you know, oh, oh, I see. whole and we sleep less. We may sleep, you know, six to eight hours and only about 20% or so of that time is in that dreaming memory consolidation phase. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, cause so like when you're a baby, like you have no skill sets to like do. Yeah. So like the sleep is it for like, yeah, what your brain needs to do. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. All right. All right. I get, I'll get you. Um, so another one is ev- it's an evolutionary purpose. Okay. This, th- this theory says that some insist that since dreaming occurs in other mammals as well as humans, an evolutionary purpose must exist. It may allow us to simulate threatening situations and be better prepared to deal with it in real life, or that it allows us to solve problems while in an altered state, mm-hmm. which I, I considering, I mean, we'll probably talk about this later, but considering some of the dreams I've had, I feel like I'm, I'm thinking like, wow, that was very dramatic. Am I trying, is my brain trying to like prep me? Like I don't, and, and, and in like an evolutionary sense, like, you know, I've read about a threat or thought about something threatening and like, what would I do? And then my brain is like working it out. Like maybe that's part of it. I don't know. What I do you think? think? It's speculative, right? So okay. I, I like this idea. Okay. 
right? Because, um, you know, how many times, how many times have you had a flying dream? Mm-hmm. And, you know, interestingly enough, you never crash, but you, I, I feel like I recognize like this isn't possible for my body to really be doing. Mm. And so maybe my brain is kind of teaching me like what's possible in the physical world when mm-hmm. I'm awake mm-hmm. versus like the dream world. Right. Um, you know, I wonder if we can teach little babies before they walk how to sign. Yeah. Um, if they would tell us that they're learning how to walk in their dream, right? The physical. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Well, and also it kind of seems akin to, you know, when people talk about kind of feelings they have, you know, I, I walked into this room and I just, I got a bad feeling and the, that feeling has to come from our brains, right? It's the way that our brain is interpreting nonverbal threats, which mm-hmm. seems very primitive, right? Yeah. So to an extent, yeah. like if, if so, I'm assuming human beings have always dreamed since we became in this format, it would be kind of along the same lines. Right. It, okay. I mean, I suppose that like we've been measuring sleep for a very long time and trying to understand sleep for a very long time, mm-hmm. um, but there'd be no reason to believe that we just all of a sudden in the last, you know, hundred years started dreaming. Right. Yeah. 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 And also dr- yeah. I'm, I was about to say that dreaming isn't exclusive to man, like mammals. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. We don't know whether other animals dream because we can't uh, speak to them in, in a way that we would understand that. But it does look like birds also have this rapid eye movement and this heightened activity in their brain when we measure it with our tools. So are birds also dreaming? Yeah. And yeah, and if it's for evolutionary, if this theory is right, of course they'd be right. Yeah, every every you know maybe moving organism would need to have this practice sandbox if they sleep. If that organism sleeps, right? If they sleep, yes. Right? Like yes. there's some organisms that like I'm I'm talking like amoeba type organisms that don't sleep, right? Do they not move? Yes. Like I'm thinking like coral reef, like. They, mm. Like with the yeah with with our water does coral dream? <laughs> <I don't know>. <laughs> <laughs> that's or a different answer. YouTube video. So we'll take, we'll, that's a different organism. So we'll yeah. we'll we'll talk about you know. Got coral. it. Okay. Okay. Um. So the third one then is uh, uh is is called emotional processing. Mm-hmm. I feel like kind of is a little bit like evolutionary, but this one says that we've learned that some parts of the brain are responsible. For that are responsible for dreaming correspond with the parts that process visual memories and emotions, as you brought up earlier. We know that sleep plays a role in mood because those who are sleep deprived, except for PBS guy, are more likely to have a higher reactivity to anger and fear during the day. So that one to me felt a little bit like the evolutionary one, but also felt like it's you know, like there's that thing that people say, like when you're fighting and it's like the height of the fight, you got to step back. And in the stepping back, like your marbles come back and you're like, wait, what are we fighting about? What's happening? And so is it kind of like a part of dreaming could be like this emotional recalibration kind of, which I know sounds very woo woo, right? And like, not, not a thing, but yeah. Maybe. I mean, this is the one aspect um, you know, my background is very much in like the, the biological aspect of neuroscience. And so this is more in the psychology portion. Okay. But I wonder, because we do exhibit, um, fear in our dreams, right? We have nightmares. Yeah. We have night terrors. Mm -hmm. We call them as children when it's a little bit more frequent. And so, you know, it could be, we're also trying to figure out these feelings in the real world. Mm -hmm. Um, we give, them credence in, in the dream world. Yeah. But I wonder also, um, if you're thinking about it more from like, why would we need to process our emotion? Mm-hmm. Like right? biologically, why would we yeah. Need to do that? Yeah. Like, yeah. is that necessary for survival? Yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. It do you have this, I mean, we have two statements of like, Oh, never go to bed mad. Right. And, <laughs> oh, let's sleep on it. Right. So which is it? Which is it? That's funny. Yeah. That's a good point. And the last theory is this theory, which I think is really interesting. And I'm like, Hmm, me just the normie norm over here. I kind of like this theory. Um, it's called the defensive 
activation theory, and it has to do with brain plasticity. And my understanding of brain plasticity or neuroplasticity is that it's the, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong here, um, that it's the brain's neural networks rewiring to function in a way that's different from how it previously functioned. Is that right? It's like kind of like there's this, like you were talking about different parts of the brain that are sort of for senses or whatever. It's like the brain being like, oh, well, this isn't being used anymore or used for this purpose anymore. So we're going to take over this real estate and use it for something else. Kind of. Is that, is that right? Yeah. I mean, okay. pretty close. Yeah. Okay. So just to elaborate mm -hmm. um, and add a few things, um, we have neurons and they have these little tendril like things and sort of like the pruning. Sometimes we need to like, or think about it like a tree. Sometimes we need to prune the tree to make it stronger in other areas. Okay. Sometimes, you know, we give a lot of extra nutrients and like areas of a tree grows. Okay. Um, with neurons are also like kind of communicating with each other too. So that communication can also be more plastic in a way. So it can, okay. um, more malleable, more moldable, like plastic. That's why we call it plasticity. Right. So it's like, think of the a bending and the right. moldable piece of plastic versus like, you know, something like a marble that we'd have to chisel. So we call our brain plastic. And it's just wow. talking about the way that our brain can develop over the, over the years. Okay. Um, and so when we're babies, we have a lot to learn. And so we're more plastic. And then, you know, I, I studied language and we have this, you know, sort of myth of like, you can't learn new language past, you know, seven, eight, nine years. That's false. But Ooh. You know, our brain does get more and more challenging to start making these connections, takes longer to grow, takes mm -hmm. longer to take away the toxins, things like that. And so our, our brain is plastic. Okay. Okay. All right. Well then, so starting with that premise, this defensive activation theory says, I'm going to read it so I don't super butcher it. Mm -hmm. We suggest that the brain preserves the territory of the visual cortex by keeping it active at night. In our defensive activation theory, dream sleep exists to keep neurons in the visual cortex active, thereby combating a takeover by the neighboring senses. In this view, dreams are primarily visual precisely because this is the only sense that is disadvantaged by darkness. Thus, only the visual cortex is vulnerable in a way that warrants internally generated activity to preserve its territory." Um, a lot to unpack here. It's a lot to unpack. I know, but I thought that was super interesting because going back to what we were talking about earlier about people remembering smells in their dreams and all these kind of things, I'm like, or how something felt or, or, or the, the, how loud that scream was, or I don't know, whatever. But it seems like the, when people recount their dreams, everyone's talking about the visuals of it. And if presumably according to this theory, it's so that the visual cortex is preserved and it's like, no, I'm here, even though a third of our lives, if we do sleep eight hours a day, we're not using our visuals at all. So I was like, Ooh, that like went bing. But I, I definitely want to hear your opinion on this. I mean, I would like more research done on this theory. Okay. So okay. That would be really fascinating, but I, I see what they're saying. So, um, if, if our dreams are sensory experiences, mm -hmm. maybe not smell, but maybe smell. Okay. Well, and our other senses sort of have these regions that they are more active in normally, right? Mm -hmm. okay, so our brain does everything all the time, but we have the visual cortex. We have, um, you know, the physical sensory mm -hmm. areas, like mm -hmm. where we can move things, touch and mm -hmm. things like that. So this theory would say, use it or lose it. Right. Yes. So yeah, it, if you, if you stop using your sight, so if we just walk around all day blindfolded and we're like touching, we're just like practicing or like, you know, playing the piano and listening to music with, without it, then our hearings, I see where you're going with this. Yeah. Are mm -hmm. just like going to take over. Yes. Like move over visual cortex. We need more space. Yes. Um, you know, it's compelling because vision is a really important sense, right? Like yeah. it, it's quite difficult to navigate in the world that we've created modern day without 
your, your yeah. vision. And going back to the evolutionary thing, right? Like I would, you know, I guess you could argue that vision is, could be one of the most important senses for survival for, you know, cause like seeing threats coming, being able to judge, you know, stranger danger and, and things like that. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it was definitely a disadvantage if you had, you know, a, a little rabbit that was born without eyesight, that rabbit would probably be left. Yeah. yeah eaten. Yeah. Sorry, rabbit. Left alone. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, be just because it couldn't, or, you know, a wolf or an owl, you know, without eyesight, even if they have strong other senses, you know, auditory or smell and reptiles, particularly, um, yeah, I mean, that's why it's so compelling, right? Yes. I would like to, I would like to read more about um, okay. how they uh, analyzed it, you know, are they seeing, you know, primary activity in the visual cortex, which seems reasonable. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, to what extent when you have visual deprivation, mm -hmm. you know, is there a comparison? Well, and I, I feel like also somewhere in this paper, I remember that, and I think you talked about this earlier that they, they were, they talked about how people who were born blind or became blind early in life still dream, but don't experience visual imagery in their dreams anymore. They feel their way around a rearranged living room, or they're dreaming about hearing strange dogs barking or stuff like that. So yeah. like they're still doing it, but I think for them, they thought, well, this solidifies it because that part of their brain, there is no visual cortex anymore, but the dreaming is still like for dangers that would exist for a non-seeing person. Right. Right. But but then I guess to your point, that would negate the theory almost, right? Because it, well, or would it? I don't know. Well, just saying that the visual cortex isn't being used in the same way. Um, and so yeah. the other senses have already like moved in on that territory. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so they're now using their right. territory, the neurons that are activating their senses yeah. during sleep because right. they're like, no, no, no. It's really important for us to practice our sound, you know, yeah. listening, you know, hearing this is what survival is now. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you're, well, I can color you intrigued, but yeah. And, and I think that there might be an opportunity. So we use songbirds and zebra finches, um, as a model animal for, um, when we're talking about our, uh, uh, auditory parts of our brain. Right. Oh, so okay. we have like a really strong sense of like auditory and speaking and communication. Okay. Um, so I want to know if when they are doing rapid eye movement, if also instead of their visual, which is there, but it's not as mm. important as their song, if their song oh. is like more active, you know, would, would be showing more activation when they're sleeping in REM sleep. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. a blind like, person oh, having sure. REM, are their eyeballs doing this? Yeah. Their eyeballs are because their going... eyeballs aren't the problem with the visual. It's the rods yeah. and the bones. But with a songbird, since, since the song, the auditory is so important, do their mm -hmm. dreams have more auditory? Yeah. 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 For a person who's blind, is their auditory cortex showing an expansion into the Yeah. Vision? Yeah. Exactly. I think we okay. can do some experiments. Okay. I wonder that I bet that's a stay tuned. Let's, let's yeah, yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, that, yeah, that one I thought was sort of the most interesting. Um, and then I guess the other sort of interesting thing I wanted to talk about in terms of dreams was the, you know, there's always this, you know, when you talk to people about it, uh, whether or not you are a lucid dreamer or a non lucid dreamer, and why does that matter? How that's a thing. And lucid dreaming is when you are a aware that you are dreaming, correct? Yeah. Okay. And so for me, I've had this discussion with people. Obviously, I understand that we probably don't remember like 95% of our dreams, right? But to the right. ones that I can recall, I do not believe I have ever had a dream that where I know that I'm dreaming. And I often, in my dream experiences, um, more so when I was younger, but every now and again, will wake up and be like, oh my God, that was, that wasn't real. Because I'm, I, what I'm seeing in my dreams feels like it's really happening to me. And I often ask people, so well, first, let me ask you, are you, uh, are you, do you do both? Do you lucid dream, non-lucid dream? I have had lucid dreams where you I'm have. like, I want to see how this okay. plays out. Okay. 
Yeah. The question I often ask people, having never really had that moment, I think once or twice I've had a, a bad nightmare where I could tell just before I woke up, there was a moment where I was like, no, and I'm awake. And I, I snapped myself out of it, but I've never gone through the dream being like, wow, this is great. And I'm controlling things and I can, and I know this isn't real. So I always ask people when you're having a lucid dream, how, are, how do you know that you're dreaming? Because, <laughs> and which sounds crazy, right? Cause I feel like everyone else is like, oh, you just do Mary. And it's not that hard, but I feel like for me, even if something extraordinary is happening in my dream. I, I don't know how to distinguish it. Like, I, I don't, I don't know. It's almost like it doesn't even occur to me that this could be a dream until I wake up and I'm like, what? No way. That wasn't real. I, I wonder a few things. I wonder if we, for 30 days made it a habit to wake you up in the middle of REM. Like if I came over to your house and I was just like, wake up, wake up. <laughs> no one, you please re retell your dream because that's when you can like instantly retell it. Mm. And two, would you know, like having the forethought, like I'm going to be woken up in the middle of a dream tomorrow. Oh, tonight, I'm going to start to like recognize my dreams. I wonder if it's like a practice skill. Um, yeah. Okay. Not to say that like, I've had that experience before where it's mm -hmm. like, Oh, but I've done this. And so like after a month, you too can lucid dream. Yeah, yeah. But I wonder if you start to like, think about it, mm -hmm. then maybe you will be able to experience it and remember that you experienced it. Yeah. Well, the problem isn't like, maybe you have these lucid dreams. You just don't remember. Yeah, that's true. Th that's the thing is I'm like, maybe a lot, so much of this, obviously, you know, we talk about dreams because they're so weird, but we're always going off of that data set of what we remember and is yeah. what we're remembering the part that super struck us the most because it's the weirdest or it's the, and so then we think that's what these are, you know, yeah. rather than, you know, kind of seeing it as a whole. I mean, I guess, you know, going back to sort of, you know, why we're even having this conversation, I think that must be part of the reason why it's so difficult to figure out what the point of dreams are, right? Is because even, I don't really know how dream sleep studies work, but so, cause you know, I think you've talked about having people or, you know, reading, um, papers written by people who are just very committed to the fact that they don't dream. They're like, Nope, I don't dream. It's not a thing. And you're like, that's it's def you definitely do like this. <laughs> you dream. Yeah. And you definitely dream throughout your lifespan or at least up into my lifespan. Yeah. But people, yeah. Pe but everyone's, it's all sort of based on this incredibly faulty recall of like what, and like the data is just, unless somebody, it's almost like the person who's having the dream is the worst person <laughs> to ask about, you know? And I think that's really different compared to sort of any other medical condition that you're studying in somebody, you know, or any other, I mean, really any other kind of, you know, neuro, you know, neurological disorder, right? So much of it is like, you're trying to understand their perception. And it seems like almost in this case, our perception isn't helping. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, at least for the dream itself, mm -hmm. right? Um, you, we don't have like the the owner of it, the source of its understanding or great understanding. Yeah, we, we definitely have better understanding of what sleep deprivation is, mm -hmm. right, and has an effect on the body. Both right, primary source on like, um, you know, our body and our physio physiology, mm -hmm. and also our mood and our emotions and our relationships. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, we can talk about like co-sleeping, not being great. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but, but you're right. I think there have been studies that I read a long time ago. I actually had a, uh, I've, I've had a fascination with dreams for a very long time, mm -hmm. um, at least since college. And then in grad school, I went to a, a talk by this old school sleep scientist, mm -hmm. more on the biological side and measurement side. Um, but one of the things that I read was we don't transition in our dreams as in, we may go to like five different scenes, mm -hmm. but we don't, you know, get into the car, walk out of the door, walk to our car, get in our car, right. turn on the you know, turn on the engine, turn right. on our AC, mm -hmm. you know, go down the street, get out of our car, unbuckle. We don't have transitions, right? Right. Yeah. School bell doesn't ring. And then you get up from your desk, you walk out the door, you go into the cafeteria door, you go in line, yeah. right? It's just like, I was in school. It was the first day. 
I, then it was recess and then I was playing tetherball. And then I had a, you know, then I had, um, you know, a medal around my neck because I was at the Olympics. <laughs> right. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Like, I mean, yeah, that, that is yeah, there, are, there aren't the natural transitions and people time after time after time when they are remembering their dreams don't have transition. And it's funny. And I, well, I think probably for most people, those lack of transitions would be the biggest indicator of you are dreaming. And for some reason, my brain just does not, I'm just like, nope, business as usual. <laughs> like nope. suddenly I'm at the Olympics. Suddenly I'm in Portugal. Yeah. Suddenly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, yeah. Inter that's interesting. Interesting. So, yeah. What do you so, I mean, I love dreaming when yeah. it's not, when it's not scary. Right. Yeah. I so what to have this, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I used to have this, I guess, reoccurring and lucid dream or it became lucid or I was going bowling and I was bolt like, you know, going down the, the alley and I couldn't let go of the ball uh -huh. and it kept smacking me in the face. <laughs> <laughs> like you're bowling and what? Like, yeah, I was like, oh. but it, didn't, it didn't hurt me. Like I wasn't physically injured. It was just sort of like a bullseye, like a repeating bullseye. Mm -hmm. And eventually I'd be like, I'm like, I'd be lucid dreaming and be like, I'm not good at bowling. I don't want to bowl anymore. Why am I continuing to do this? And then I would do it and it would hit me in the face. That's so funny. And so I would remember like, I'm doing this dream again. Huh? And, yeah. Oh so, yeah. Like, here we go again. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cause I know I've had recurring dreams too, but I don't, I realize they're recurring when I wake up. I don't realize it's recurring in the moment. I don't realize like I'm, cause my, like the thing I sort of um, kind of struggled with, especially when I was younger about dreams was I would have a lot of, I mean, I guess nightmares, but not like Freddy Krueger nightmares. It was just more like a lot of my dreams were about life and death things. My dreams were ultra dramatic and it was always about either trying to save myself or trying to save someone else who was in just some dramatic peril. And, you know, it was always like a lot. And I remember, you know, you know, my mother kind of giving me books about dreaming and a lot of it tended towards this theory of emotional processing of like, well, you know, clearly you're working. I mean, clearly you have things that need to be worked out and your dreams are doing it. And a lot of the books are about learning how to lucid dream as a way to give you more tools to help that process along. And that was mm -hmm. kind of, so I, you know, I was like, oh, okay. All right. I, I guess, but I, mean, I don't know, you know, if, if, if that's that more of a psychological thing or maybe it's multi-purpose, right? Like many things in our body have multiple say, functions. If, yeah. If you think about that example, you know, because we genuinely as scientists, community don't know why we're dreaming yeah. your, your scary dreams, especially the ones that had like an emotional valence could be all three. It could be the emotional processing of yeah. learning the basics, you know, happy, sad, scared, um, surprised. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it could have also been you're practicing what's real and what's not. If you're like saving your parent off yeah. of a cliff and you're like finding out what gravity is in the real world and you're practicing it. And so it could have been that like physicality aspect of like that threat and what's a threat and what's not a threat. Like how often am I really walking on the side of a cliff where it's like, I could slip. Okay. Don't yeah. do that. Life. Yeah. I mean, it also could just be memory consolidation, right? You watch yeah. a show or, or like Aesop fables, right? Like yeah. and you're like, Oh, I'm remembering that story. And, you know, maybe don't walk, wander, you know, too far outside yeah. of my community. And so you're mm -hmm. also storing your, your memories. Yeah. And it, I think it, it could, you know, the more we talk about it, it sounds a lot more like kind of other science topics that I've discussed on this channel, where some of the things it's not like, you don't have to pick a lane. Like it can be, you know, especially like in physics and whatever, there's sort of these ideas of more like, oh, it has to be string theory or it's this or it's that. And seems like kind of the more that goes on, it's like, it's a, you know, a little from column A, a little from column B, a little, you know, rather than like, no, the reason I need the one reason, come on, you know? I think that that's uncomfortable in our world, right? So yeah, to have Like, oh, we dream because it is consolidating our memories. Yes. And if you don't do it, you will forget your life. Right. And <laughs> like that sort of like box, but really the, I think, one of the biggest challenges that from, from sleep researchers that I've read is that we have these four stages of sleep mm -hmm. and we might be doing different things at different times. And so maybe REM sleep 
maybe we don't remember all of our dreams because we don't have dreams all the time. Mm-hmm. And so that's a reality, even though the, the brain waves show that we're in the REM sleep, maybe sometimes we're consolidating memories. Sometimes mm. we're cleaning out toxins. Yeah. Sometimes we're growing our visual cortex. Yeah. You know, maybe we have these different reasons and that, you know, that's somewhat satisfying too, because yeah. we have such a complex organism in our, like, you know, organ in our yeah. brain, and, you know, what 86 million neurons like doing their thing and they're integrated and they're talking to each other and they're also specialized areas that you know are doing things all of the time yeah I mean I think I'm gonna leave it at that man because (laughs) that's a yeah I think that's a good way of of thinking about it and uh and I, I feel like every part of each of these theories that I kind of read out that we were like, okay, but it's not the whole answer. Okay, but it's not the whole answer. This yeah. kind of, yeah, kind of is it maybe it is all of the above, you know, maybe that's an answer. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much for doing this with me. I really appreciate it. You. Uh, yeah. Have a great yeah, and I will talk to you soon. And that's the video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Depring also started writing a book at the beginning of the year about secrets, and she has a pre-sale campaign on Indiegogo right now, which I will link in the description below in case you are interested in finding out more about that. Please let me know in the comments below what your thoughts on dreams are. Did any of these theories intrigue you? Do you guys lucid dream? Because I, I do not know what that's like, <laughs> at least not that I can remember. And as always, I will see you guys in the next video.